Hello, everybody. In this series of lectures on church history, actually, it's the first part of a comprehensive church history class, uh, and it covers from the beginnings of the church to the Reformation period, so to about 1500. We're dividing church history up into these three segments, the apostolic church from AD 33 to 100, the early church from 100 to 312, that's the conversion of Constantine, and then the period that I call the Christian Empire from 312 to 1500, divided into both an earlier period and a later period. In this lecture, we're concerning ourselves with the later period of that expanse that I call the Christian Empire. So approximately the years 1000 to 1500, you know, whenever we're making divisions like this, they're really done in a very general sense. We're not trying to say there's hard and fast things, but there's definitely a, a, a trend that becomes evident in that general era. So in this lecture, we're going to consider three notable figures of this later period, the late medieval period. We're talking about somewhere between the year 1000 and 1500. The three figures we're going to take a look at in this lecture are Anselm, Aquinas, and Francis. Anselm of Canterbury, Thomas Aquinas, and Francis of Assisi. So let's begin with a look at Anselm of Canterbury. He's most famous for his work, Why God Became Man, but he was a prolific theological author all on his own. Anselm was born in Aosta, Italy. As a young man, he was in conflict often with his father, so he left home at a young age. After some years of wandering, he settled in Normandy, that's the modern coast of France, at a village named Bech. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. There he became a monk, and when he was 60 years old, he left that abbey to become the Archbishop of Canterbury, England. So in the year 1093, Anselm became the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he served there until his death uh, in 1109, with a few exiles that we'll speak about in a moment. And in 1098, Anselm wrote his most famous work, Why God Became Man. Anselm was an important figure in the founding of what is known as the scholastic tradition in medieval theology. As Robert Klaus wrote in the New International Dictionary of the Christian Church, scholasticism began in the monasteries, not in the universities. This is what Klaus writes. He says, they had various advantages over the secular schools, the greatest of these being the close and continuing contact between the teacher and the student, given a bright teacher, a tradition of learning, and the unhurried pace of a monastic community, the results could be very impressive. And in the case of Anselm, they were very impressive. But this was the beginning, Anselm being the most notable early uh, person in the scholastic tradition. Scholasticism was a form of theology and philosophy that was taught in the schools of Western Europe, mainly in the 11th through the 14th centuries. It sought to apply the thinking and the organization of the Greek philosopher Aristotle to Christian revelation, and it hoped to bring together reason and faith, philosophy and revelation. And again, this founding of scholasticism really owes more to its roots in the monastery, as Klaus mentioned, than it does in the university. Although, of course, it came to dominate the universities uh, in later periods after its beginning. Now, many of Anselm's works take the form of his conversations with his students as he tried to answer their worried questions. But Anselm believed that faith was the necessary foundation for philosophy, but also that understanding that his reason and philosophy could in turn make faith deeper. Anselm is famous for writing this, I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe that I may understand. 
For this I also believe that unless I believe, I will not understand. There Anselm arguing very strongly for the foundation of faith and especially we would say faith in revelation, God's revealed word, and making that the basis for philosophy or the investigations of reason rather than the other way around. Anselm pioneered a more philosophical approach to theology, and these beginnings were further developed by other people, especially by uh, Peter Abelard, Uh, He lived after mostly the time of Anselm, the year 1079 to 1142. He was an influential and controversial teacher of theology who lived in Paris. Now, Anselm developed the idea of what we call the ontological argument for God's existence. Basically, the idea that logic demands that there is a supreme being. So here's an example of Anselm. We'll walk through it. It's a little complicated. He says, So truly, therefore, you do exist, O Lord my God, that your non-existence is inconceivable, and with good reason. For if a man's mind could conceive of something better than you, the creature would rise above the Creator and judge him which is utterly absurd. In other words, in some sense, Anselm's arguing simply for the existence of a being that is beyond our conception and what we might call a necessary being. God has to exist. There has to be an ultimate being uh, that goes beyond our ability to understand and figure out. And his existence is inconceivable, to use a word. Now, Anselm also came into conflict with the kings of his day because he refused to recognize the right of the kings, in this case it was the English king, to appoint people to religious offices. So over a span of several years, Anselm was exiled from England twice, coming back to Canterbury in the year 1107, two years before his death. We'll conclude our very brief examination of Anselm of Canterbury with this further thought by Klaus. He says this, Robert Klaus writes, although he did not work out a complete system of theology as the later medieval scholars were to do, his treatises cover much of Christian thought. And again, maybe Anselm is most important for his role as being sort of the founder of that medieval scholastic tradition. Now, of course, he didn't formally found it. It's just that his thinking of trying to synthesize faith and reason, a philosophy and theology, especially that uh, philosophy coming from Aristotle, that was foundational and worked out over the next several centuries in medieval theology. Second on our list for examination today is Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas's most famous work was the Summa Theologica. It was his master work. He was a very incredibly hard-working and productive theologian, whose philosophical system, known as Thomism, I don't know really why we don't call it Aquinasism, we call it Thomism after his first name. Thomism is still influential, very much so, in the world of theology. Paul Helm, in his New International Dictionary of the Christian Church article, uh, begins that article on Aquinas simply like this. I was just impressed with this beginning of the article. He says, uh, just begins like this, he was the greatest philosopher and theologian of the medieval church. Well, that's about it. I mean, what more can you say? He was, according to Helm and many others, just simply the greatest medieval theologian that was around. He was a large man, a quiet man, and a serious man, so much so that his classmates called him the dumb ox, 
or we might say today, the silent ox, because again, he was a quiet man. But he was born about the year 1225, and after his early schooling, Thomas Aquinas went to the University of Naples. There, he was so impressed by his teacher, who was a Dominican monk, that he also decided to join the Dominican order. It's kind of interesting because Thomas's family was not in favor of this at all. His family wanted him to have a religious profession and a religious life, but not to become a Dominican monk. Thomas's family wanted him to be an influential and wealthy abbot or archbishop, not a monk under a vow of poverty. So, Thomas's brothers actually kidnapped him and held him for 15 months. His family offered to buy him the office of the Archbishop of Naples, which tells you something about church corruption that day. You could just buy an office such as Archbishop. And his family even tempted him by sending a prostitute to his room. Now, none of that worked. So Thomas went on to pursue his theological education in Paris under the great teacher Albertus Magnus, also known as Albert the Great. Now, in that day, the classic Greek and Roman authors were being rediscovered across Europe. Again, it didn't begin in Aquinas' time. It had been going on for some time, but it was still a very devoted field of study. And Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, was especially popular. Thomas focused on taking everything from Aristotle's writings that was acceptable to Christianity, organizing it, and explaining it. At the beginning of his massive Summa Theologica, which means a summation of theological knowledge, Thomas stated this, in sacred theology, all things are treated from the standpoint of God. And then Thomas proceeded to distinguish between philosophy and theology, between reason and revelation. And though he emphasized that these things did not contradict each other, both of them are fountains of knowledge. Both of them come from God. Thomas explained that reason, again, this is sort of according to Aristotle, is based on our sensory data, what we can see, feel, hear, smell, and touch. That's reason. Revelation is based on more than any of those things. Now, reason, according to Thomas Aquinas, can lead us to believe in God. This is something that other theologians had already proposed. But he said that only revelation can show us God as he really is, as the triune God of the Bible. Thomas's theology is not easy reading, and it was not universally well-received, not at first. Some of his statements were even condemned by the Roman Catholic Church after his death, though those condemnations were later reversed. But before long, the system of theology proposed and explained by Thomas Aquinas gained preeminence. So when Catholicism faced the rise of Protestantism in Europe, again, this is centuries after the death of Thomas Aquinas, then Catholicism used the works of Thomas Aquinas in the drafting of the decrees of the Council of Trent. Four years after that, uh, that would be the year 1567, Thomas was declared to be a doctor of the church. That means a high scholar, so to speak, of the Roman Catholic Church. And in 1879, a papal declaration endorsed Thomism. Now, again, that's the theology of Thomas Aquinas. And it express, endorsed Thomism as an authentic expression of Roman Catholic doctrine and said that it should be studied by all students of theology. Today, both Protestant, 
and Catholic scholars draw upon the writings of Thomas Aquinas. Here is an example of his writing. And again, we must admit, these medieval scholastics wrote in a style that's difficult for us to really grab a hold of. But let's just read this paragraph and sort of take it in the best that we can. Here we go. Thomas Aquinas. I reply that man was bound through sin in two respects. First, in servitude to sin. The devil, by inducing man to sin, had overcome him, and therefore man was assigned to the devil as a slave. Secondly, in respect to the occurring of a penalty, according to the justice of God, Therefore, since the passion of Christ was sufficient and superabundant for the sin of the human race and the penalty incurred, his passion was a kind of ransom by which we were freed from both these obligations. Here, Aquinas is just simply trying to explain the effects of what Jesus did on the cross. We were, in some sense, slaves to sin, and the work of Jesus on the cross set us free. Secondly, we have a penalty according to the justice of God, and that is also satisfied by the work of Jesus on the cross. Now, Thomas Aquinas was certainly a theologian in the medieval scholastic tradition. Because the tradition of scholasticism had been around for more than 150 years in his day, Thomas was able to respond to those who had gone before him. For example, when it came to understanding the atonement, that's the general subject of the quote I just read to you, When it came to understanding the atonement of Jesus on the cross, two views of Christ's atonement uh, conflicted in Thomas's day. Anselm saw the atonement as a satisfaction for the sins of God's people. Peter Abelard, another very prominent scholastic theologian, claimed that the atonement was essentially an example of love that drew people to Jesus Christ. Thomas agreed that the atonement had a very deep example effect on the people of God, but he strongly emphasized the substitutionary nature of the work of Jesus. So he agreed that there's an example in the cross, but that does not take away from the fact that Jesus Christ died as a substitute, as being guilty in the place of those who were guilty, so that those who were guilty can be accounted as innocent before God. The atonement, Aquinas taught, was not only an example for us to follow, but it was also God's solution for our sin problem. The death of Jesus on the cross erased the stain of sin. It paid for the offense against God, and it took away the power of sin in our lives, giving us the power to live a new life. Thomas also wrote in his Summa Theologia, Uh, Theologica, he says, um, I reply, I'm noticing I don't have this particular quote up. That's all right. I'll just give it to you here. He wrote this, I reply that a proper satisfaction comes about when someone offers to the person offended something which gives him a delight greater than the hatred of the offense. Now Christ, by suffering as a result of love and obedience, offered to God something greater than what might be expected in compensation for the whole offense of humanity. Again, this is Aquinas' way of explaining how the death of Jesus could pay for, could satisfy God the Father and pay for our sins. This understanding of the atonement placed Thomas much more on the side of traditional conservative Christian theology than what might be called the rationalist school of Peter Abelard. 
Through his life, Thomas Aquinas turned down offers to be made a bishop or an abbot. He didn't care about having those prestigious positions. He was a humble man who wanted to study his theology and write his theology. Not long before his death, after apparently seeing a heavenly vision during a worship service, Thomas Aquinas said this. He said, All that I have to this point written seems to me nothing but straw compared to what has been revealed to me. After that remarkable revelation, in the year 1273, Thomas Aquinas gave up all of his theological writing, either because of the power of this revelation or because of poor health. And so the Summa Theologica was never actually completed. But Thomas Aquinas still has an enormous influence on theology, even to this very day. So we've talked about Anselm of Canterbury, about Thomas Aquinas. Now let's take a look at our third and final individual that we're just going to study in this brief lecture today, and that would be Francis of Assisi. As a young man, Francis was, over time, converted from a hedonistic lifestyle. He gave up his future career following his father as a successful merchant, and he started spending his days meditating on the Lord in an old abandoned church. He felt God drawing him uh, drawing him there. He felt that he was near the presence of God as he hung out in this old abandoned church. Well, Francis started reaching out to the poor and to the lepers. And after a pilgrimage to Rome, he felt God telling him to rebuild that old broken down church. So he sold what he had and he gave the money to a priest to start the work. He also sold some of his father's merchandise, and when his father found out, he was so angry that he actually had Francis arrested. His father demanded full payment. So what did Francis do? He gave his father the very clothes off of his back, right there and then. He walked away naked. Nobody could doubt the commitment to give everything for the sake of following Jesus that Francis had. He eventually started traveling around preaching, obviously he found some clothes, and living simply by faith. Soon there were many who wanted to imitate Francis's example of a radical commitment to Jesus. He and his followers would go out two by two preaching the gospel and helping the poor peasants in the fields. Francis and his followers challenged the conscience of their generation, but they had to pay a price for that. They were the constant objects of scorn and attack. People often said that he was insane to give away everything and to live poor for God. He and his followers were often pelted with mud. They were insulted, and they had their humble clothes torn off their backs. But Francis always distinguished himself by bearing such attacks and accusations with good nature and gentleness. After a while, Francis and 11 of his followers went to Rome to see the Pope. They wanted his approval of their mission of poverty and preaching and Pope Innocent III gave his blessing upon their movement. Later in the year 1212, he sought the Pope's permission to organize as an officially recognized monastic order. His monastic order was supposed to be dedicated to a life of simplicity, and they called themselves the Friars Minor, or we would say the Little Brothers. That was the beginning of the Franciscan monks. And the followers of Francis were monks, but they weren't the type that went away to the desert 
or the type that shut themselves up in monastery walls. They were out ministering to all sorts of people, preaching the gospel and helping the poor and needy. Francis had a passion to preach the gospel to the lost. So he started evangelical missionary works to Syria and to Morocco, but he was unable to complete them because of illness or adverse circumstances. In the year 1219, he traveled to Egypt, hoping to convert the Sultan Kamil. But the Muslim leader never responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Francis also tried to go to the Holy Land, but he was stopped by a shipwreck. The evangelistic zeal of the Franciscans would continue after Francis' death. Some of Francis' later followers even went as far as China preaching the gospel. The last years of Francis' life were sad. With the continued growth of his movement, Francis asked Pope Honorarius to appoint a particular cardinal as the protector of the Franciscan order. And changes were made in the rule that governed the order of Francis, changes that turned out to be for the worse. In the same year that the new rule of order was approved, Francis resigned from his own monastic order. He died in the year 1226, when he was just 44 years old. When his body was examined for burial, people noticed curious red scars on his hand, on his feet, and his side. Now, these are traditionally referred to as the stigmata. People think that they were mystic replicas of Jesus Christ's wounds. Now, those marks were never confirmed during the lifetime of Francis. But according to traditions, they were said to be there when he died. But there was nothing to indicate that they were miraculous in origins. Maybe the best way for us to end our very brief look at Francis of Assisi is to think about a famous prayer that he wrote. It goes like this. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, not so much to be understood as to understand, not so much to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we awaken to eternal life. I think you have to admit that's a wonderful prayer from a man who was a true disciple of Jesus Christ dying in disappointment that his own monastic order had changed so much from his founding of it that he resigned from his own monastic order. But Francis, I think, stands as a lasting example of Christian commitment. So, in our look at these three men from this later medieval period, we see two men who were great scholars— Anselm of Canterbury, and Thomas Aquinas. And we see another who was a great disciple of Jesus, that is Francis of Assisi. Hope this has been a benefit to you. Uh, Hope that you can join us for our next few uh, lectures as we get closer and closer to the end of this particular lecture series. Thanks for joining us. Hope you can join us again.